So uh, Dick Winkler went to high school in San Francisco, right? Tell me about a little bit about those days. Well, I was very fortunate. I had a job when I was in high school. And I had enough money to go to Stanford for one quarter. One quarter. <laughs> but it was probably only $100. $220. And a because of the war, you know, they were desperate for students. <laughs> So you got so, into Stanford, but so, you only spent one quarter there. Right, and then I was in the military for two years, four months and 19 days. But he wasn't counting. <laughs> <laughs> and came back to Stanford with the GI Bill. So I lucked out. <laughs> so you got now, your, your bachelor's and, or just your engineer's degree there? Well, I got my engineer's degree, but I was fortunate. I was looking in my graduate work to do some work and Genston arranged for me to have a government contract to build a classroom. So I knew Ed Genston pretty well because he sponsored me. In fact, I was, he got sick and I, I drove by his house just a few hours ago. <laughs> and I had gone to visit him and he died the next week. Oh, yeah. And, uh, so tell and us a little bit about your thesis project my, my and thesis what you project. did on that. So it was to, to build a klystron, and I've got the figures here. And I think that the numbers are pretty outstanding. Oops. And that, you know, it, it was to generate two million watts of microwave power. And I, my vacuum tube was about this. I've got your picture, oh. and we'll be looking, we're looking at it on the oh, screen. Okay. So there about it is. this long. <laughs> And it had a 110,000 volt transformer on it, which produced 73 amperes, and a pulse light at five microseconds, so it didn't burn up. But there was still enough power in that thing, it had to be water cooled. So, you know, one of the things I had to study was water cooling. You know, how do you cool it, this, this thing? <laughs> so a lot of science went into these, these projects. And uh, now the reason that, and then I got a government contract, you know, probably to against them, ended up funding this project, including the machinists to make all the parts and plating shops to make play things and the like. And uh, the reason they wanted a klystron, and I'm not sure it was made quite clear, the klystron was an amplifier tube. You had a cavity at the beginning and a cavity at the end. You put a steady stream into the first cavity that could be controlled by a crystal oscillator. And so it held its frequency solidly. Power came out of the other end with a lot of power. But the frequency was controlled by this crystal at the beginning. And that's what allowed you to have Doppler radar, because you could compare the signal at the beginning with what comes back from your target and tell how fast the target's going. So the military wanted this for radar, and, the, and it's called Doppler radar and it's only possible because of this synchronization and frequency. So you uh, built these things, had some good machinist helps there, but oh, yeah. tell us about some of your, uh, was it your elementary school buddies you kept running into again? Well, yeah, <laughs> that's, that's sort of beside the point. We, we were all very inventive as kids, and one of them just died this last week and was in the New York Times for having invented the first computer that had transistors and a keyboard. Mm. And four columns in the New York Times last week, mm. Sunday. Mm. But he was a very good friend of mine. N.C. Chang was a classmate yeah. of yours, wasn't That's he? That's correct. And he worked with you on the Kleistron? Uh, no. Philip the electron no, gun? No. Uh -huh. no, he did that on the medical accelerator. Oh, okay, we'll talk about that later then. And, and these Kleistrons, because of the steady frequency, it, and the, the amount of power was involved. You know, it ended up as a radar, as they say, all over the United States. They built them. It became the radar during the Cold War. 
and I've talked to people who were in charge of radar stations, and sure enough, they had my tube as the driver for their radar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, after you left Stanford, you went to a company that we were taught we talked about a little earlier tonight. Worked with uh, Bill Shockley at Shockley right. Transistor. Yeah, Sh Shockley mm -hmm. at his office, blow mine. <laughs> mm -hmm. I became the manager of that for a while. But you didn't run into uh, Bob Noyce and... No, they were out of there before I got there. Okay. But, um, you know, transistors was certainly a major part of my life. Mm -hmm. You know, I designed a powerful enough transistor that the military could use it for a walkie-talkie. Back in the early days. And so walkie-talkies became the beginning of a cell phone. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was my transistor that I had a patent on that started all that. So then you uh, went to, to the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. You were an early employee there? Well, I worked for Shockley after I'd been at the, uh, at the Accelerator Center. Well, let's center. go back to Slack then. So the, one of these... Kleistrons, of course, ran every single one of the big Kleistrons that he had for the accelerator. And there's a huge difference in size between my Kleistron, which is only this long, and the big ones. <laughs> and so this became the driver for each one of those big ones and was able to hold the frequency, as I say, constant. So the electron beam would go down the right way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so then the other thing that it ended up being used for, Stanford made one of these accelerators as a medical device. And this Kleistron drove those. Now, one of my grammar school friends that I could talk about, because we, we did a lot of mischief together, <laughs> he was the doctor on the other end in Chicago in a hospital. And so Stanford sent this first medical accelerator back to my grammar school friend. And we talk on the phone weekly, <laughs> still. <laughs> and so he estimates, as a doctor, where he put them, installed them all over the world, there's probably a thousand linear accelerators worldwide now. And, and uh, Dr. But Carl Van Essen, kind of, that was his whole life was working right, on those. Right. All, and as I say, all over the world on the medical accelerator. Mm -hmm. And so we see that even today for uh, cancer treatment and things like that. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's not. <laughs> it's a little bit dangerous. Well, a matter of fact, my, even my Kleistron tube had enough radiation mm. because of the voltage. I had to put a lead cap yeah. on it to stop the radiation. And it had enough power. I had to learn about water cooling in order to cool it, the thing enough that I didn't melt the bottom out of the clay stone too. <laughs> well now as we were building slack, you were involved in the, uh, the test equipment and bringing up the, uh, the uh, clay strums? Well I did, uh, Ginson had me design a measurement device mm -hmm. that could measure microwave power accurately. Okay. And that was put on all the clay strums that were used on the accelerator, the big one. So it took it took lots of people doing a lot of things. Uh, Dick uh, was lucky enough to get into the, the with uh, Ed Ginston right. into building these claystrons and then worked at SLAC right. uh, and had uh, started off a good career there. Yeah, and as I say, I enjoyed going out with Lorna Dorney. Yeah, <laughs> Varian. Now, Lorna Varian was uh, was Sig's uh, daughter. Right, dated her at Stanford. Well, she worked uh, in the microwave lab. Oh, she was working there. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. At the Hanson Labs. Right. Well, you never know. It's a small world in the valley, uh, especially in those days. It was much smaller. It's bigger now, but we still do tend to run into uh, uh, sometimes the same people, sometimes new people that can help us with ideas. Thank you, Dick. Yeah. We're gonna we're gonna keep Dick up here on the panel. I'm gonna ask uh, Alan to come up. Alan Odian. Let me uh, switch over to him.